morning. Before I forget, let's do a mock check. That was very difficult. My chair makes so many noises. I'm getting very inflexible in my old age. Okay, welcome to episode four of Monday Morning Moccasins. This one is an exciting one. We have our first guest. In just a few moments, well, a few hours for me, a few moments for you, we'll be talking to Zach Watson. So that should be fun. We're gonna talk about a few things. We're gonna talk about uh, what's going on in the activity now. We're gonna talk about you know where he marched and some stuff like that. And got some really great questions to ask him. We're gonna be talking you know about things that he's doing like outside of the activity, what he's been up to, what he's working on, stuff like that. It should be really, really great. I'm really excited. Um, but a few things before we get to that. Um, catch up a little bit. I finally finished a song. I've actually done it and released it. Um, I released it over on not the Instagram that I always link in the description, but an Instagram that I have that not a lot of people know about. Only that my direct people know about. It's not something secret. It's not like a private Instagram. I'm public on there it's just i wanted to make an instagram that had like a hundred followers and i was only following a couple hundred just because i hate social media and i wanted to spend if i was going to spend time on instagram i wanted to not be flooded with just a bunch of garbage so i created a new instagram anyway rambling on about that um i released it over there and yeah it was cool um if you're interested in hearing it, um, let me know in the comments, and maybe I'll upload something here with it. But uh, I actually finished two songs. So the first one I've I've actually released. The second one I finished yesterday, um, and it's just chilling on my hard drive. Um, and I think I've got about like three left. Three before the EP is done. Um, so that's pretty exciting. It's pretty cool. It's been fun. Um, what did I write there? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, this week has been hectic. Um, coming back from the Bay, I knew I was going to have a lot of schoolwork and so did my girlfriend. She, we were both just extremely stressed out with school this week. But at one point, I was sitting here realizing that I had three exams, four quizzes, um, like a mini like essay writing assignment, a discussion post, and something else. Something else due. I had all those assignments due in like a 48-hour timeline. It was like, it was terrible. But I got through it, and I took my last exam yesterday for the week. And then I took a quiz that's due tomorrow, yesterday as well. This semester has been a lot of work, but it's been like super annoying, tedious, busy work. It's not a difficult semester. It's a difficult semester, but it's like, it's a manageable difficulty level, I guess. is Like it's not, it's hard, but it's not like out of reach. Sometimes when I take classes that I just like don't, care about because they're just graduation requirements sometimes they're hard and I'm just like I don't know anything about this subject because I'm not I'm not a geology major <laughs> but and so sometimes the shit's just hard and I can't do anything about it because it's not my my area of focus so I can't like reach back into my past knowledge of the of the uh the subject to you know do some critical thinking about well, you know, whatever is the problem, but yeah, it's manageable. I'm getting through it. I'm excited for the summer though. Um, and I'm excited to 
do my last year. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I've got a whole year left, but I think knowing that I'm on my last year will make the last year like a lot easier and a lot more like school will never be enjoyable, but I will be more content with what I am currently doing, knowing that I won't have to do it for much longer. I think is where I can say, where I can say is what I can say about that. What's next? Okay. Well, yeah, that's about all I got for that. And I've also only got one news story, but I like the news intro so much that we're going to roll it. Let's talk about the news. Okay. Well, I've only got one bit of news, and it's not really news. Nothing happened. Well, a huge thing happened for America, but um, I actually don't know enough about it to really make a comment like that, but I have heard about this happening, and then I wanted to highlight this because it's connected to somebody in the drum corps community. So if we go to Phantom Regiment, if you go to their Facebook page that I haven't liked yet, we'll do that now. Okay. Um they made a post that says, update, touchdown confirmed, Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. When the Perseverance rover touches down on Mars today, okay, I see this is the unupdated, so they updated. So it started with, when the Perseverance rover touches down on Mars today, it will be partly because of a Phantom Regiment alum and NASA engineer Aaron Costello. We are so proud and we will be watching along with bated breath. And so Aaron played Contra for Phantom. It looks like around the 2011 range. I don't know my Phantom brass uniforms, so I couldn't tell you for sure. But I clicked on this link, and we go over to the NASA website, and here she is. So a little bit about her. I just wanted to highlight her because I think this is freaking cool. Just that, like, I mean, nothing really has anything to do with DCI in this situation. But, like, I just think it's pretty cool that we're able to kind of learn that, like, you know, a band nerd like us, like a little band nerd like me, you know, went and did this thing for NASA. Although I know a lot, actually, a number of... um like crazy NASA people that also did marching band. I think they might go hand in hand a little bit more than I'm <laughs> alluding to. But anyway, uh, Aaron Costello holds uh, a bachelor's and a master's from Cal Poly Slow in aerospace engineering and an MBA from USC. She joined NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in 2013 in the Mission Assurance Organization. She started her career supporting the SMAP uh, Solar Array Assembly and followed that into SMAP Spacecraft Level Assembly and Testing. Aaron contributed to the Mars 2020 Hardware Quality Assurance Team for six years as the QA lead for both the Descent Stage Subsystem and the Sample Caching Subsystem. She then joined the ATLO team, supporting final integration, test, testing, and launch ops at Kennedy Space Center. Aaron is now working on the Mars Sample Return campaign, supporting both the Sample Return Lander and the Capture Containment and Return System. So that's pretty cool. Those are a lot of uh, big sciencey words that my little pea brain will never ever be able to comprehend. But she played tuba for Phantom, and I think that's cool. And now she's in NASA. And now she's doing these things with the with the machines on the planets. I saw this one um, meme uh, where it was a picture of like Mars. It was like the first picture came back or whatever, and then it was basically like any sort of like modern like protest scene that you see where like the signs and like the like 
like the standoff ones where it's usually like you have the riot police and then you have the protesters. Well, it was the scene of the protesters all lined up and then it said something like, like go home, we don't want you here or whatever. <laughs> it was pretty funny. I'll see if I can find it and I'll put it up. Okay, well, that's all I got for sort of news. I just wanted to highlight that because I thought it was sick. Um, we'll move on now to Hall of Dame. Okay, so Hall of Dame. I'm actually not picking anything. I'm picking someone. And it's easy to pick this someone because he's the first damn guest on this podcast. The first human inductee to the Hall of Dame is Zach Watson because he's the first guest. And that's special to my my puny 100-view podcast. But, yeah, anyway, Zach, welcome to the Hall of Dame. All right. Well... Without further ado, I've still got to wait about three hours before I can actually talk to Zach. Um, But for you, it's going to be three seconds. Here is my interview slash hangout slash coffee date with Zach Watson. All right, Zach Watson, welcome. Thank you for here, thank you for being the first guest on Monday Morning Moccasins. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm excited to talk to another another human being during this. Yeah, um, I wanted to get my own moccasins to be honest. I watched your older episodes of yeah. you just doing it solo on YouTube, but uh, I have my my Toms. Okay, that, hey, that I'm wearing that's right good now. enough. That's good enough. I'm actually my moccasins aren't even on right now. Let me slip those on. <laughs> I'm a I'm a fraud, dude. It's like it's your own podcast. <laughs> I know. Okay, yeah, they're on. Cool. Um, so how you doing? I'm doing good, man. I had some indoor drumline this weekend, and today is my day to just record some stuff and chillax. So awesome. that's where I'm at now. Sweet. All right. Well, let's get started. First, um, I don't know if you remember how we met. But I believe is we we sort of knew of each other through like online in the drum corps world. But then we I believe we stood next to each other in the 2016 retreat in WGI, yes. and that's how we officially met. Yeah, I vaguely remember this. You actually sent me the talking points, and you, I saw the how we met bullet, and I mm-hmm. had to like really scrape my brain to be like. Did we meet? Like, I I know we did because we stood next to each other. Yeah, it was yeah. something along those lines. I remember just weird shit like that all the time. And so, oh, yeah, like, all the time. that was probably just, like, not even a highlight, anything that, you know, held place in your memory. But for some reason, that was like, oh, I believe we have. We stood next to each other and we talked for, like, two minutes. Um, oh, it's the beauty of the band world. Yeah, you get random memories like that all the time. There's people that I met that have no idea who I am anymore, yeah. but I'm like, oh, I remember that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was cool. So that's how we met for uh, for anyone curious about that. Um, cool. So yeah, just for more people getting to know you, uh, where are all of the ensembles that you marched? Yeah, so I can give you the quick rundown of the history. So I started drumming in middle school, barely, like doing some concert stuff. I got into high school not knowing what drumline was, but I knew that it was an option. So I was like, I guess I'm going to do that because I already played a little bit of drums. And uh, I got lucky enough to go to Forsyth Central High School in uh, Forsyth County, Georgia, which was at the time Scholastic World uh, competing in WGI and GIPA. It was like one of two or three schools in the state that was doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I just very fortunate. And I did the indoor program at that high school all four years. Uh, Our junior year, we didn't come out with a line because we didn't have enough kids that like wanted to input that type of energy and time. Mm And so I went to go look for my own marching experience. And I went to Atlanta Quest actually for the first time in 2013 oh, uh, when okay. they were still open class. So I was 16 oh, wow. years old, junior year of high school, went to AQ. And uh, that was a great season. I was very young, marching with a bunch of college kids. So like little young adult Zach Watson had to kind of appear. And uh, it was a good experience. After that, I marched Atlanta CV, uh, oh, okay. DCA on quads. 
uh, Corey Sages of the Blue Devils messaged me on Facebook and said, hey, can you carry quads? And I, at the time, was like 98 pounds Mm -hmm. and 5'5", and I was like, I think I can do it. (laughs) I was like, that sounds sick. Like, let me give it a shot. Uh, It was tough, and I never marched quads again, and I went back to snare drum, and that's probably one of the reasons. Yeah. And then beyond that, I marched Spirit of Atlanta on snare drum in 2014. Uh, I marched Blue Knights in 2017 on their snare line at the end. And then uh, during indoor, after I graduated high school, I went back to Forsyth Central for 2014. I went to MCM for 2015. And then I came back to Atlanta Quest after marching there originally in 13. Went back to Atlanta Quest from 16 to 19 and aged out there. Cool. Yeah, so I, th- I think you're like, you aged out in 2017, right? Yes. Yeah, so you're just a year older than me. So when you start talking about like Atlanta Quest in 2013, like that was my junior year of high school. I couldn't imagine. I know some people do it. I know a few people that have marched WGI in high school. But what what is what is it like marching an independent organization while still being in high school that previously had a drum line? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it was cool. Uh, with the whole Atlanta scene, all of the world class groups are very very close together geography wise, uh, and so. The auditions for Atlanta Quest actually got hosted at Forsyth Central for one of the weekends. And so that was a really cool thing where I got to be the one who was like, hey, I know what's going on around here. Like, I know where our zones are for auditions and rehearsal. Um, Also, I'm auditioning and I'm pretty sick, I think. So (laughs) give me a contract. So that was kind of how it went. It felt good. Um, And doing it throughout the school year was pretty tough just because, like, you have to get out of school and, like, drive to quest and then you're staying with the college kids at their houses and then yeah. you go back home and do high school again right uh, and so it was cool it was a great learning experience and uh definitely opened the door for independent world drums later on which is nice yeah and then so then marching you said quads at atlanta cv uh yeah. shortly after that right was that the following summer yeah it was the following summer so i finished up indoor and then i immediately went into like weekend drums for dca yeah and so that's dca so i know i've seen the atlanta cv truck at like the atlanta regional but what was like the extent of your tour so yeah we did a couple of like local shows we'd have some performance opportunities and then like a dca hosted competition in georgia they would go to the dci regional in atlanta and then at the end of the season, we would drive up to Rochester, New York, where they would have their kind of finals and stuff like that. And yeah. there may be a previous show around that area, but generally it was just sort of like indoor drumline where it's local shows only until right. the end of the season. And okay. then you fly out or you travel out to go to the finals. Cool. Sweet. And then so then you graduate um, and then uh, you said Spirit of Atlanta. Yes. But that was your that was your last drum corps season before Blue Nights correct yes that was yeah that was my rookie season of drum corps on snare drum and it was the only season of drum corps i had before i went to bk in got it so the the decision to not march continuous summers what kind of went behind that was just you weren't into it you were up to other things and indoor worked better with you yeah so one i love indoor drumline yeah I, indoor drumline is where my heart lies i love dci and i love all the things that it offers but indoor drums like i will stick with it for a very mm-hmm. long time and uh I had a good summer at Spirit in 2014 in the respect that I had the opportunity to like move my hands a lot and get a lot better, and there mm-hmm. were some good teachers there that I really appreciated, but the overall experience was not for me as a marching member, hmm. uh, and I did not have a good time. I didn't feel like I was prioritized uh, in, as human health uh, right. in that respect, and so it was just one of those experiences where I was like, I can just stick with indoor and go really hard at this and not have to suffer through two more summers of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it actually wasn't my plan to ever march drum corps again. Oh, I okay. didn't actually didn't follow the activity much in 2015 and 2016. Like it had left me kind of jaded, mm-hmm. bad taste in my mouth yeah. from my 2014 summer. Uh, and so I lightly followed it because I had friends that were involved and f- indoor friends that I was connected with, but I wasn't trying to go hard at it anymore. Right. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point you bring up just sort of, I mean, I'm tempted to call it abuse, really, that some, you know, some members kind of go through that activity. I I personally, I don't know if I'm like, like tougher, per se, but I know I went through some things and surprised that I didn't quit. I wanted to quit several times. I almost didn't march my age out. Sure. Um, 
but yeah, I'm, I, I always think about that because uh, like my girlfriend always, you know, talks to me about kind of what I went through with those summers and some of those summers are, you know, brutal. Like you, oh, yeah. you, you get to the really hot states and then, you know, the turf is like 50 degrees hotter than the 100 degree weather that you're in. And then you have the staff yelling at you and then you've got to go sleep on a gym floor and then you've got to go do this show and like it's brutal sometimes. So I definitely don't blame you for not wanting to do that for summer after summer, you know? It, it, it was cool too because I had had such fulfilling experiences already with Atlanta Quest in 2013 and mm-hmm. it felt I felt like I got so much better in that indoor season that I marched when I was 16 years old and then I turned 18 and I didn't drunk whore and like I maybe came out of it with like a little bit of a better understanding in some areas but mm-hmm. I felt like my chops got worse. Oh, like I feel like I I didn't like get better in the way that I wanted to as a performer uh, yeah. when I marched that season. And within the Spirit 2014 season, there were other issues on a bigger, deeper level with the administration and the way that money was handled and mm. fees that were taken from members that didn't necessarily correlate with what they got back as a product. That's yeah. always my big thing with dr- a drum corps. It's like you always have to understand with the drum activity is you are paying for a product as a marching member. Mm -hmm. And if the organization is not delivering the product that you invested your money in, you should say no and you should go find another experience. And so at that point, I was a little jaded by it. And I was like, yeah, not where my money's going to lie. Yeah, that that's also another interesting thing that I think about sometimes like the uh, the sort of forgetful attitude of like freedom in the drum corps world. Like a, a lot of drum corps members will not stand up to the authority right like to the text to the caption heads Absolutely. to the director but you also have to remember like every like most like 99 percent of the people on that field they're everyone's adults and you at any moment can say like i'm not going to do that i don't want to do that but it's we have this weird like feeling of obeying authority like always through that and so you you know some of these some of these i hear stories just of like snare techs you know usually snare techs that only last about a year in an organization that are fresh out of the activity like marching um that have just aged out and they make their their drum lines go through some gnarly things because they can't like get a triplet roll exactly how that tech wants it in that very moment in time yeah and they'll make them run to like a freaking 7-eleven four miles away just because they can't play a triplet roll yeah it's weird. It's really, yeah. really weird. I mean, there's the there's the overarching vibe that you get when you go into a respected organization where, you, like, you sign the contract and you you obligate yourself to marching the full season, like mm-hmm. at the beginning, and it's understood that like, hey, we're a family, like we're gonna be doing this thing all summer, mm-hmm. and so there's no doubt, like, I'm not surprised that people are scared to speak up when yeah. they finally feel like they're at their breaking point a little bit and like this is like too much for me to like be willing to handle because there's a lot of other people that depend on you. Right. Uh, and there's there's a guilt judgment there that is a little difficult to handle, especially when you're young and especially yeah. when you've only done it for like one season or it's your rookie summer. Like, right. Yeah, that's so yeah, it's it's nuts to think about that. Um so going back, obviously your heart's in, in WGI and so Starting with, you know, AQ in 2013, pretty young, then moving up to an organization like MCM with what they're doing, you know, like top five pretty much every year, and then going back to Atlanta Quest. Um, What kind of was your thought process in kind of getting a taste of, you know, I'd hate to put this sort of, you know, I don't know, like hierarchy or appreciation. Oh, feel of, free. No, like, yeah, if, I always feel icky, like praising, like, oh, like the people that like March BD and then maybe you won't again, like you got the taste of a winning organization. And then, you know, didn't, sure. I hate, I hate that attitude, but the, you know, the younger drum corps band nerd and myself that idolized groups like blue coats, I can't help but wonder why you would be up there with MCM and then come to Atlanta quest with no disrespect to AQ. I love AQ, but that transition, what, what yeah. was the process, the thought process behind that? So, when it came to me pursuing my season at MCM in 2015 in general, it was because it was like a massive goal of mine. And I had been taught by a lot of Mystique alum mm-hmm. at my high school because we were Scholastic World. And so we had the opportunity funding and because we had the name and notoriety to where we could reach out. Mm-hmm. And we could bring an MCM guy in to teach the snare drums or like, hey, this guy would randomly come in and they would write drill for us. Shane Gwaltney came in okay. and wrote my high school drill my sophomore year. 
Uh, so I had some like light connection with some of them, and it was inspiring when I was 15, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I was like, you know, once I finish my summer at Spirit, like I'm going to MCM, mm -hmm. and I let everyone know. Yeah, I was like, prepare to see me there, like next <laughs> winter, like I'm auditioning, like you should know I'm auditioning. Um, <laughs> And the people at Quest knew that too. And I, I said that during 2013, one of our um, drill writers now, uh, and at the time was a snare tech, Zach Marshall, mm -hmm. was a snare drummer at Mystique in 2011 during mm -hmm. Mantra. And he taught me a lot when I was very, very young, very, very fast, and I felt I got a lot better under him. So I was like, yeah, whatever experience you had, like, I want to go check it out. Yeah. So I did the MCM 2015 season, and honestly, it was crazy. It was awesome. Um, I attribute them to like the reason that I'm such a good marcher, mm -hmm. like the the visual responsibilities that were asked of me, um, the the physical strain it ended up putting on my body it actually ended up hurting me a little bit oh. in the future, and which is one of the reasons why I didn't necessarily go back. But like the experience was very very uh, hardcore, aggressive. Like you know, let's buy into this. Um, and there were a couple instances I had where. Um, I had the thought in the back of my mind of like, if I'm gonna do this for a long time, um, I want to stay at the same place. And I think my greater priority is trying to build up an organization or at least contribute my own voice to an organization for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. rather than just trying to get tastes from a lot of different places. Yeah. So drum corps experience is a little different for me because I was just grabbing tastes. Mm -hmm. Whereas indoor, I was like, you know, I love this. Like I want to stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, when I ended up comparing my experience at AQ13 to MCM15, I ended up just coming out with the overwhelming interpretation that my voice was going to be more heard and I would have a faster effect on what was happening in an ensemble way if I went back to my home organization mm -hmm. um, and decided to contribute my time to that. And it was no disrespect at all to the MCM guys because what they were able to provide for us and the product that you get to perform and mm -hmm. the intensity with which you do it is like super unique and cool. And yeah. it's a very, very like we all buy in and we're all going to go 100% hard and that you feel good when you do a show like that on the floor. But in the end, I was like, you know, I want to grow something and MCM is already in a place to where they have all the voices they need to be successful and to pursue all their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think AQ could could use my voice a little bit, um, not in like a, a hoity-toity way, but I was yeah. like, I've had some experience now, and I'd like, I'd like to go back and share some of this. The experience of moving around between the groups was a little strange, because even though I told everybody in AQ13 that I was going to leave and go to MCM mm -hmm. in 15, uh, I got flamed a little bit by the old AQ guys. Wow. For like leaving. And right. w when I didn't, I didn't really let anybody know that I wasn't coming back to Mystique in 2015, that I was going to go back to Quest. That decision was made closer to audition season than I would have liked to have made it. And when I left Mystique to go back to AQ, I got flamed by Mystique. Yeah. And it was just like individual members. Of course, it's not a whole like carpet representation of like the whole group, but like individuals felt weird about it and emotional about it. And I'm still the marketing guy in the back of my head that's like, I'm paying for a product, and right. I have a thing that I'm looking for when I pay for this every single year, and if it doesn't fit my my budget or like what I'm looking for, I'm not going to buy it. So yeah. <laughs> It goes back to that, that same freedom thing where we're the ones paying the money, and if we're you know dissatisfied, it's the same thing like going to buy something and then taking it back because you didn't like it. Of course, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, a, yeah. that's a, I think that's really important to remember for, you know, maybe the young members like trying to make their way and march in their first couple years. If you're unhappy in that organization, just because, you know, they're top five pretty consistently, if you have, especially a local group, cause you're in Atlanta, right? Yeah. So you are, yeah, I live in the Metro Atlanta area, 30 minutes away from AQ. Yeah. yeah. So just inherently way cheaper to march AQ than having to go to MCM every weekend. Yeah, did you more feasible? Did you move up there or did you travel every weekend? I traveled. I actually got back from Spirit 2014. I didn't have my driver's license yet because I never got it when I was in high school. And I got my driver's license right when I got back from Spirit. I learned how to drive a stick shift. And within four days of having my new stick shift, I drove the four hours to Tennessee to go audition for Mystique. So it was wow, like a really funny. fast, like, all right, you're getting your car and you're going on the road. Yeah. Um, so it was cool. It, it was a fun experience in yeah. that respect. I actually have a pretty pretty similar story. My parents actually drove me 
to Dark Sky auditions in 2015, both for the first audition and the callback. And then when I yeah. got the contract, I still didn't have my license. And so I um, I think it, the, the timing of it was perfect. I got my license shortly after getting the spot in Dark Sky and then uh, I had to basically just like take the test, learn how to drive. I, the very first time I drove on a freeway was to my first Dark Sky rehearsal. Yeah, that was me in a stick shift. I yeah. had done like the back roads around my neighborhood and I had like made the movements and everything. I was like, all right, I think I got it. And then yeah. I was grinding my gears all the way up to Tennessee oh, left and right, just having a good time. But yeah. it was probably dangerous. Yeah, the, the things we do <laughs> for this activity. Um, yeah. So, so many years with AQ now, you are teaching there. Um, yeah. So what was sort of the um, approach? Did did the caption head come to you and and... You know, how did that, getting that gig, how did that come about? Yeah, so I think even before I marched BK and even before I went back to doing drum corps for my age out year, um, Alan, Alan Sears, Sears, the director at Quest, as well as Zach Marshall and TJ Choquette, who are mm-hmm. either the battery caption head or visual caption head, um, had, had kind of come up to me in different moments of the season and been like, hey, like, we appreciate like you coming back to AQ after your season at Mystique. Like I know that it was partially like an experience thing and you wanted to be here instead, but also like it's cool that mm-hmm. you did the thing and you want to come back and contribute. Um, I was at Quest for so long by my fourth and fifth season, 2018 and 2019. Um, it was almost like an Anya situation where that's, that's exactly what I was about to say. I I attribute you to one of those super members of AQ, just like Anya. Yes, yeah, and that's exactly what it was. I mean, like in Anya's respect, like when I was marching 2013, it, he still had two seasons left after that. And even in 2013, he was a little bit of like a, a sub tech, like <laughs> like he's a member, but his voice has been heard for so long, and he clearly has the experience, and he's clearly the highest achieving one there. Yeah. So, and like, I, why would you not listen to him? Right, and I totally sideline he also went to mcm for a year he was the mantra drummer yes he was actually not marching indoor for school that year okay mcm approached him later on throughout the season and was like hey we need like a character for this like are you available like would you like to do it and so yeah for the 2011 season he drove up and did the the trampoline drumming which yeah is sick. that's yeah i always thought that anyway going back to it but yeah, yeah, no, it was cool. The super vet situation is always kind of weird because there are some new members who like know who you are and know you've been there for a long time, but you don't have a personal relationship with a first year member when you're mm-hmm. a five year member. Right. And so it's not the same as like a third year member who has already marched two years with you and like will immediately just kind of like do the things that you suggest, you know, or move in the direction that we feel is best for rehearsal at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, by my fourth and fifth year, it felt like I was in sort of like a sub tech position where like yeah. if I needed to say something and I was like, hey, like we need to keep our voices down. Like there's too many people in this rehearsal. Like we need to stop talking. Everyone would say like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was cool. It was cool to be in that position at AQ. Um, and that's what helped transition me into teaching where once I aged out, TJ was already familiar enough with me having my voice involved. Mm-hmm. And so much of the snare pedagogy at AQ was already kind of coming from me mm-hmm. and the structure that I was setting up for it, that it kind of just made sense to transition into the person that was keeping it most consistent for the last couple of years. Right. And so your last year at AQ, were you center? Yeah, yeah, 2019. I was center from uh, 17 until the end, 17, okay, 18, cool. 19. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Um, backtracking to uh, BK, when you kind of pulled that, you know, la- w- that last drum corps season, your age out kind of out of nowhere, what was the uh, sort of idea behind doing that? Were you just kind of like, I should do one more before I'm done or – yeah, that's a it's a really funny kind of story. Paul Kim was a quad drummer at Atlanta Quest and also a quad drummer at Blue Knights right. for a couple of seasons. Love Paul to death. He's he, one of my favorite yeah, human beings. I, I, I've we've ever you know with. we've conversed lightly, but I know him through uh, through Josh, my buddy. That's yeah. spent several years with BK. Yeah, yeah. He's a sweet social media memer too. He'll mm-hmm. post on everything and he'll give his little like two word take. It's always funny. Yeah. But yeah, Paul Kim approached me and was like, hey, I'm driving out to, to Texas, to the Texas camp to do one of the Blue Knights auditions. Um, you know, like I had a guy that I was going to kind of go with and he bailed. Um, would you like to come with me? 
So it was not my intention at all to march the 2017 summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I had not planned on it. I bought the packet. I paid the application fee, and I did the thing. The day we were supposed to leave to drive out, Paul Kim messaged me and said, hey, I don't know that I'm going to be able to make it to this camp. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever. I went there by myself, and so I got in my van. I had a minivan at the time, and I made like a seven-hour trip in a day and then slept at one of the AQ snare drummers' houses in Mississippi and wow. then took the other half of the trip. And then uh, I went to the BK camp anyway, and I got a call back. Um, and it was obvious that my hands were not like uh, acclimated to the way that they played. I had yeah. to adjust a lot of stuff. And I had the, the I, I call it the fake BK hands. Mm. And I think that's what Mike Jackson would probably call it too, is yeah. like the, oh, you're painting a picture. Like you're trying to look like a BK snare yeah, drummer, but your hands like aren't doing the thing. Yeah, the fake yeah, preps. Yeah, the whole and sweet all. left thing, yeah. Yeah, I watched YouTube videos and I studied and I was trying to mimic and like I was doing as much work as I could to just like show up as an age out and like go hard and like yeah. make it. Um, so I got a call back and the, ex the audition experience was hard for me. Mm -hmm. uh, there were multiple times where they gave me credit for the way that I talked with them about mm -hmm. the concepts that I struggled with, which I thought was really, really interesting. Like in my audition experience, they valued the fact that I was able to take constructive information and like talk with them about it and right. talk with them about why I felt like I was lacking in those areas. Um, and so, yeah, I got like the very last spot. I fought yeah. for spot nine and I made it and it was a great experience. It was totally parallel to my 2014 summer. Mm -hmm. um, Blue Knights always had a way of prioritizing the member experience and making sure you're getting enough sleep, you know, and if you had a, a real problem or grievance, like you could come up to them. And yeah, it was my 2017 summer is probably like one of the best times uh, or maybe the best experiences I felt as a human being. Like mm -hmm. I felt all powerful and I was like my age out summer and I was just like every day of rehearsal going hard and i was like i never felt a grievance about it it was it was super cool well yeah because especially the only thing you really had to compare it to was spirit like you know four years prior three years prior like that's yeah a, that's a huge jump after marching on the east coast for so long um atlanta quest was very good about taking care of me as a person because i invested so much into it mm -hmm. um I think I had overwhelmingly poor experiences with like member care at both MCM and Spirit initially when I marched there. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that they're doing that anymore. And I think both organizations are representing their members better than they were back mm -hmm. then. But uh, it created like a standard in my mind to where I was like, all right, this is the baseline for like how you're treated when yeah. you do drum corps or when you do indoor. Mm -hmm. And then I went to BK and they like blew it out of the water. And I felt like I could be like a real human being and like have conversations with my staff members. And yeah. like I was free as an adult who was over 21 to like go and do his own things on his free time. And like mm -hmm. it was so cool to like be treated like a real person. Yeah. 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 I'm really, I'm actually really glad that we're, we're kind of touching on all those sort of like age things. Cause we have a, actually have a question later talking about kind of the age of drum corps members, you know, when mm -hmm. it's too young and too old. So we'll go into more depth with that. Um, Real quick, I have sort of a off-topic funny question. In 2016, you guys introduced, I believe, the lot hype that is the uh, the car magnet delivery thing. The wing nuts. Yes, the wing nuts. I, for I was forgetting yeah. what it said on there. I want to really know how that came about. Where did you yeah. get that? So we had a snare drummer from 2013 to like, uh, he may have taken a year off or two, but made it all the way to like 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, name was da Daniel Hester. And he was a delivery driver with Wing Nuts Chicken. And he, uh, and he worked there almost his entire AQ career mm -hmm. and lived in downtown Atlanta and made good money off of it and kept doing it. And so he had the delivery magnet for wing nuts on the top of his car mm -hmm. and he would bring it to every rehearsal and to every single lot and he would drop it in the front. And at one point, he went online and saw that wingnuts.com, a domain name, was available for purchase oh. because they had let it expire. And so Daniel Hester purchased the wingnuts.com domain name and started to build a SNAQ alumni page. And wow. so you could go to wingnuts.com and you could see like the past snare lines of Atlanta Quest and like information about those members. And eventually Wingnuts reached out to him and was like, hey, like we want our domain name back. Yeah. And like as an employee, like you can't have that. That's like, true. That's I, probably a problem. <laughs> I was going to say, did he get any money from that? But they probably threatened him any, if anything. 
it didn't last it didn't last for a long time but when it happened we were like geeking out and we were yeah. like yes wing nuts hype like yeah let's put it in there and so yeah we kept using the sign uh, even after he aged out uh, he had the sign with him and brought it for like another year or two. And oh, that's since, cool. of course, the pandemic, it's kind of yeah. dropped off and we haven't had local competitions. So Right. Yeah, that's one of my favorite lot hypes I've probably ever seen. Oh, it's funny. It's Especially cool. we march onto the floor usually in like a three by three block of our nine snare drummers. Mm-hmm. And so we'll always do like the official marching band, like walk yeah. in to the floor and like do like a snap or whatever. Yeah. And of course the person in the middle has like the wing nuts, massive magnet slung over his shoulder. <laughs> it's uh, cool. It's That's a fun awesome. thing. Um, so were you teaching with AQ um, leading up to the WGI 2020 season? Yes. Okay, yes, cool. I, so I wanted to ask you sort of what the whole initial reaction to the whole pandemic starting with the WGI season getting cut off. Because with DCI, it sort of was like, oh, this might not happen. And then it didn't happen. But WGI was starting to get into the thick of it. It was March, you know, oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. it was not even in the thick of it. It was dead center in the season. Like, what yeah. was that like? Oh, I felt so bad. Uh, it was just one of those things where it's like, these kids had worked really hard on it and honestly aq 2020 at the time was probably like one of the best snare lines we've been Mm. able to put together one of the best bass lines it was just like super vets and they were just like slamming the whole season like ready to go and do their thing um and so it was sad uh that we had to stop mid-season and kind of pull out we did like one final local show um that we managed to pull together at a place Mm -hmm. uh and it was uh, Atlanta Quest and Equinox and some of the, I, maybe like a local color guard or something who just mm-hmm. performed in a gym for everybody. Um, and we just canceled, essentially. You know, we, we pulled it off and yeah. we did the thing. And when it came to auditions for the next season, we did most of them over video. Mm-hmm. And then we had like a final in-person audition camp where the people who had gotten their callbacks from the videos got to meet up in person. Um, and we kind of already knew at that point who we were looking for Mm -hmm. um, because of the fact that we advertised a like truncated smaller season for Atlanta Quest. Mm -hmm. So Atlanta Quest this year in 2021 didn't do a full like indoor season production like they normally do. Mm -hmm. Um, And we didn't compete at the local shows even though there are local shows that are being hosted around us right now. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, I was gonna ask that. So you are also teaching with a high school, right? Yes, I teach at Milton High School. I'm the battery coordinator there, so I write their music and I teach their teach cool. their drums. Cool. Cool. So, what was the the audition process? I know it's a high school, so the audition process is you know pretty different um, from an independent organization. But in the same time that AQ was trying to hold their auditions, what was the high school sort of trying to figure out with that? So at that point in time, we didn't even know whether fall band was going to be an option for us like whether that was going to be an activity that we did at all. Mm -hmm. So we kind of like gave out weekly newsletters and kept the kids updated, but we didn't have official auditions through the, the spread pandemic season up until band started in the fall. And what the Milton organization ended up deciding was that they were going to do football band and they would play in the stands Mm -hmm. um, and they would do a small pre-show organized performance, but they weren't going to be rehearsing every week and they weren't going to be trying to build this normal halftime show that would be like BOA competitive as they normally do. Yeah. So when we did auditions, it was the week of band camp. It was, we had finally had a date where we could get back together and meet in person with masks and precautions and every kid's temperature being taken and answering a questionnaire and stuff like that Mm -hmm. Um, but it ended up being like a stands band only thing so for the fall we just kind of set the line as like one big group we had a lot of like tom and flub drummers Mm -hmm. and we had a lot of people who were just kind of trying it for the first time to use it more as like an educational camp experience rather than like a true competitive marching band experience. Right. And so auditions for that were pretty lax. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned AQ's not doing any local shows. Um, is your high school doing local shows? Yes. High school is doing local shows. So the difference between, uh, so like what AQ, Q2, and Milton are doing mm-hmm. um, are kind of different. AQ, what they have been focusing on this winter is their perf- They've put together this performance with the Atlanta Drum Academy, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the cool... They have an awesome YouTube channel, like 200K subscribers, super fun. Um, 
trying to bring other ensembles from Georgia into a bigger video project that mm-hmm. is like professionally shot and edited and write some like cool performance and show beats and create some like video moments. Mm-hmm. And so this past weekend, they had their final day of the season. AQ is done as of yesterday. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I saw it on an Instagram story. You had been doing some video stuff, so but they're done. Season's over. Yeah, it was awesome. We have a so one of our uh, executive directors is also involved in like movie and TV show shooting, mm-hmm. and he was able to bring in a crew of people with like a camera on a crane oh, and wow. these sweet lights, and it was like really like fog machine, like total like produced concert type vibe. Yeah, uh, with both Atlanta Quest and the Atlanta Drum Academy. So they haven't been competing. They've been putting together performance music specifically for that video shoot. Got it. Q two is our open class organization, uh, which is competing in world class for our local circuit this year. Oh. Just because they're the only featured open or world class ensemble at these local shows. Interesting. No other world class groups are competitive in there, and so they're dipping their toe into what local world class looks like. Yeah, just well, by, just what a great chance. opportunity for some of those members that were only expecting an open class season, and now they're getting sort of the the judging reactions of what a world-class yeah they're going to be treated as if yeah yeah Yeah. they were world-class within that local judging scheme which is cool it's a great experience for them uh but they uh our open class group originally decided they're going to do a full season like if they have the opportunity to they're going to create a normal show they're going to go to as many local competitions as are available and take as many precautions as they can Mm -hmm. uh but they're going to like do the full experience that aq is not getting so i thought it was kind of cool how the open class group ended up being the featured ensemble within yeah. Georgia rather than the world class group because they were kind of doing these more like performative type of experiences. Right. Pretty yeah, that's a, that's a great opportunity. Um, and then Milton is doing the same thing where they're doing a normal indoor season, but they are also submitting their videos to WGI for all their virtual competitions. Mm-hmm. And they have some deadlines that they have to meet in terms of recording specific videos and getting them submitted in time to where all of that can work competitively. Cool. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. You've sort of got all three tiers of what has sort of been able to come out of this whole thing. Yeah. You got the pure independent thing, doing their own thing, you know, that AQ's doing. You then you got, you know, uh, the open class group, you know, still doing some competition and then getting a taste of world class, and then you've got Milton doing the actual sort of what WGI is putting together. Right. So AQ with their video production, they're not doing anything with WGI, they're not submitting anything. No, not as far as I'm aware. If Got there it. was a recording that's going to WGI, I didn't know about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with actually teaching like in person, what are kind of some of the challenges that you've been faced with and some of the differences? Cause I know with, you know, I've, I've teched a snare line, you know, for a couple of years and, and part of the teaching is being able to get you know pretty close and you know you're drumming on their drums and you're touching their hands you say feel this try this what what is sort of kind of some challenges that you've been running into trying to teach students with the uh you know precautions and restrictions yeah i mean one masks are an initial challenge immediately not being able to see my mouth move makes it hard for kids to understand me especially with a normal sized ensemble Mm -hmm. trying to speak to all those people i'm glad i have my drum corps and indoor experience from the past Mm because i know how to project my voice at this point and get my voice through the mask to get to the kids but Mm -hmm. there are some texts that that we've had you know and teachers that i've taught with in the past who i know would be like struggling to make themselves heard right Mm -hmm. now just based off of that um beyond that you know we take the kids temperatures every single day that they show up for rehearsal and we have these questionnaires about their level of exposure and we do our best to kind of track the kids and there's a county level procedure that they have to follow as well that milton high school knows that for all of their extracurricular activities they have to be abiding by these certain guidelines so if like a kid gets covid or if a, a kid's parent gets covid Uh, they're quarantined for the next like week and a half to two weeks and if any of the other kids were around them within the last like 48 hours they're probably also getting quarantined and pulled off the floor so there's been a couple of instances where you know somebody in a flute ensemble got covid and Mm -hmm. they happened to meet in person within the last 48 hours and so i had three kids missing Mm -hmm. and so there's definitely a challenge with like working with a portion of your ensemble that I've had to struggle with as a teacher being like, mm-hmm. all right, I have, you know, two snare drummers, a quad and three bass drummers. Yeah. Like, what do I do today? You know, like what's, what's going to go on? So I think that's probably the biggest organizational struggle. Yeah. But, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to sort of this whole thing 
I guess ending. I don't really know what the end will look like, but I'm sure. definitely, you know, looking forward to the activity sort of getting back to, you know, where it's supposed to be and um yeah. and how it's supposed to operate. Um moving forward, I came across a video on your YouTube channel that I freaking love. Um it's the fear of failure framing effect and moving success video. Um, oh, dude, I'm glad you love it. I felt super self-conscious making it. No, I I came <laughs> I came across it and I was like, oh my god. The, first, I'll backtrack back to what you were talking about with the BK and how you're able to have conversations with those staff members. It's they're a very philosophical bunch of educators. Oh, and yeah. just watching <laughs> you know some of your videos and talking with you, you are also super philosophical and you're very clear with your words and your thought process towards everything has a lot of depth to it it's been a struggle yeah yeah and so uh to find a video like that where you're you're talking about such a a deep um subject within sort of a very i don't know sort of straightforward activity like drumline um i wanted to get sort of more of elaboration on where you might have applied um that knowledge into something else that isn't drumline yeah, so I mean, as soon as I finished marching in high school and I graduated, I started teaching as well. Um, and I think in my experience teaching high school drums, because I've done it for a while at this point, going to like year six or seven now. And so it's like probably one of the most beneficial things I've learned about trying to communicate to people brand new ideas that they're totally foreign and unfamiliar with is that you have to teach them some sort of basis of language first before you can get into anything interesting or cool about it. Mm -hmm. And so, like for me, there were many years when I was like trying to apply like world-class drumming concepts without having any words or definitions for like what those things actually meant or like mm -hmm. what was tangible information that I could apply. And for like the Milton kids, my struggle over the last two years has been like, I know we were previously a scholastic world group, but we need to go through this process with new staff and new people of like, teaching you how we teach and what words to expect mm -hmm. so that way you can get to a point to where you can say those words back to me and we can start to have a conversation about it. Right. If we can talk about the concepts that you're learning and you can ask questions to me about it, you're in a place to ask yourself the questions and you're in a place to where you can start to actually evaluate that information and teach yourself some new stuff. Right. But I have not had that experience at many places that I teach because I've done it for a year and I've gone somewhere else. So mm -hmm. a lot of my experience has been like, how quickly can I teach the language of drums? Like how quickly can I articulate this new idea in a way that a new young student can like grasp onto it and then speak it back to me and yeah. we can have a conversation about it. As long as we get to that point, they learn so fast and they get so interested and they love drumming because they're like, ah, oh, I understand it. Like I can yeah. talk about it and I can figure it out. I can do this on my own. I'm good at it. And so that video the fear of failure and the framing effect topic came more from me having that experience of being a really bad drummer for a long time and even when i got exposed to world class not feeling like i understood what i was doing or why mm -hmm. and then i went to bk and i got to have the experience of just like asking my staff members whatever i wanted and they had words for everything and they had definitions for everything mm -hmm. they had tangible things that i could align with things that i had already heard in my past experience um, and it was it gave me the opportunity to build like this framework in my head of like what technique i was using like what my approach was as a snare drummer uh, and that was super fulfilling mm -hmm. i came out of the 2017 season being like i know how i drum i know why i drum that way I can teach a new kid how to drum that way if mm -hmm. they can speak the language back to me and we can have those conversations. I can explain to a point how you get there. And so coming out of 17, I felt like all powerful. Yeah. I was like, dude, I finally have like the knowledge that I've been looking for. And it wasn't new knowledge. It was just like, ah, I can say it in a way and I can frame it in a way that is easily communicated and is interesting. So the framing effect video was me kind of being like, all right, I've gone through the experience of getting good at drums and I've gone through the experience of learning a new language for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that was like a realization that was super inspiring to me because I was like, cool, like I'm bilingual. I can speak English and I can speak drums. Like, yeah. so what's next? Like, that's a great window for me to kind of move into a lot of other things. And so I do YouTube and Twitch now <clears throat> um, and I broadcast a lot of stuff just because I like talking about things and I like putting words to things for people that don't feel like they have words for things. Yeah. And so, yeah, 
it's just kind of opening that door to being like, yeah, I can get good at a lot of other stuff because I've gone through the experience the first time. And that's really important to recognize. Right. Yeah. I'm sure you're also, um, you've also been approached with uh, this question that I get a lot is when they, um, when like normies or commoners, whatever you want to call them, you, when you're trying to explain drum corps to them and then oh, yeah. they say, oh, like, so kind of like professional marching band. So do they pay you? And then you have to say, no, I pay several thousand dollars a season to be able to do this. And I sleep mm -hmm. on gym floors and I live in a bus. They're always then they're always asking like, why would you spend so much money on something that, you know, sounds so terrible. And I think that when I came across that video that summed up exactly my feeling towards why I did it, it was all of the experience and all of the things you walk away from something like that and being able to apply those to practically everything, the the direct um, application being teaching, but then, you know, teaching drums, um, but yeah. then you could even use some of those things to teach regular subjects. You can move it when you want to learn a new skill or a new hobby. Like there's so much value behind, you know, kind of what you go through in the marching activity as a member that you can apply when you age out and you're, you know, doing other things in real life. So I came across that and I just, I was like, yep, that's it. That's the answer to everything. Yeah, it's super funny. Like, I love that you say that and that it connected with you. When I was making the video, I was like, people don't like to hear wordy shit. Like, <laughs> they just don't want to like, and I know that there are people that I've talked to at Quest who have like struggled with like what they're gonna do once they finish drums. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I know that there are people that are like, looking for more words to figure out how to transition out of this thing that yeah. they've committed a lot of time to. Um, but yeah, it's really, really interesting. It's weird how it, you feel like you're starting from square one after you've committed a lot of time to something yeah. when you're totally not. And with the investment thing, like that's a hard thing to convince people of is like, should you spend that many thousands of dollars doing drums and WGI? Right. And I was like, yeah, I feel like at this point, drums is the closest thing I've found to a streamlined way to mm -hmm. get good at something. Yeah. I don't think you have to be smart to get good at drums. You yeah. can, I've met plenty of people who have trouble keeping a conversation or just like understanding basic concepts, but have moved their hands enough to get good at drums and it's really, really helped them. Mm -hmm. And so it's cool to teach drums to people being like, hey, this is something that you can get good at with a very simple process and you can take that info and it's going to help you for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And that's part of why I like teaching. Yeah. That one of the more basic things that I personally have pulled out from uh, the activity was when I'm trying to do anything um, that's maybe skill um, oriented where I've got to kind of learn how to do something, practice it and then get good at it the whole sort of we just need reps type it's like that that line is so common throughout every single group just get some reps come on do we just need some reps i use that probably way too much in my own personal life when i'm trying to do something and i can't figure it out i'm like oh, i just i just need reps i just I need, need to practice it yeah there's like, a rightful place for it there's yeah. a rightful place for it sometimes you do just need more reps yeah not all the time. Though. Not all the time. But yeah, <laughs> I, I use it way too much. And when, I, when I'm when i lagging on something, I should be already good at it. I'm just like, I just need reps. It's all good. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that's such a just an interesting concept that I don't think enough people talk about. Just being able to, you know, use what you, what you get from the activity into your career, essentially afterwards. That's, yeah, that's, I think sort there's of some the people that are, that are geared towards it. I think some people like naturally are like puzzle solvers. Mm -hmm. And when they get a new piece of information, they're immediately trying to see how that puzzle piece like fits into a new puzzle that yeah. they have somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but not everyone is naturally that way. And it's not a positive or a negative thing. It's like some people have to figure out how to learn how to talk about something and how to recognize patterns and pieces in a brand new activity. It's yeah. not natural. So I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with any new activity or any new language, it's like, you know, how fast can you get to like a basic speaking level? Mm -hmm. If you can get to the basic speaking level and get to a position to where you can ask questions about it and learn a little bit more, then boom, you're going to fire off and you can, whatever your pace is set at, you're going to be able to maintain. Yeah, extremely valuable. Um, so moving on, we've got um, just a few questions for you. Um, so this one is from Isaac Cannon. Um, and it's on the picture of you in uh, 2017. Oh, and yeah. he says that 2017 is his favorite drum finish, but he wants to know what your favorite drum finish is. And 
I think I'm going to leave it open to not only where you've marched and what drums you've actually played on, but anything, any group, any year, what's your favorite drum finish? Yeah, uh, my answer is going to be at least a little disappointing to some because it's the 2017 drum. <laughs> Those drums were so beautiful. I remember the day that we unpackaged them and I knew that like that was my drum for the season. Mm -hmm. One, like... I have never, ex I, I've unboxed a lot of drums. Like we get new drums every year at AQ. We get new drums at Spirit when I marched there. Mm -hmm. I had never experienced such warmth in my heart at being able to pull that drum out of the box and be like, yes, this one's mine. Yeah. And there were extra stipulations that came with it because the finish on those drums, it wasn't like glossed over or laminated. And so like moisture wicking mm -hmm. and like any moisture pulled into it would stain the drum. Mm -hmm. And so there were times when it would like, randomly start sprinkling or get wet outside especially in colorado where the clouds would just like randomly pop over a mountain right and it suddenly starts raining where we would book it inside because we got to take care of the drums so yeah make sure that the finish doesn't get ruined so it was partially like a man like i've never had to tr treat a drum like this importantly before yeah that was like cool about it but also like this is one of the most beautiful pieces of equipment i've ever had the opportunity to use and yeah i'm gonna use it forever yeah, the, the Mike Jackson era of BK and then, you know, uh, Orange County Independent, you know, going into Broken City, like all of those drum finishes were they just when I, and I heard that um, he models them, at least the, the earlier years that he was with the groups, um, he'll take a, a drum set that Mapex has already produced that has that finish. This was more back to when they had the uh, sort of that wood grainy vibes with those. Yes. He'll tell them, I want that drum finish, but on marching drums. And I yep. thought that was so cool because that was just like unheard of, you know, to yeah. like, I want that one, you know? It produces some really, really beautiful equipment. And yeah. as a marching member, like I felt like it was an honor to like yeah. hold it. Yeah, it was a super weird thing, which thinking back on it, I'm like, yeah, okay, it was a normal drum. Like, I know, nothing yeah. was weird about it, like a standard Mapex, like what it, it is what it is. But at the time I was like, Whew, yeah, sick. I can I could geek out on drum finishes all day. That's just the inner you know yeah. freshman kid in me. Um, so my dad actually has a question. My dad asks questions on all of my videos, and I love it. Um, That's awesome. I've seen some of them. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, side note, he is also he has started a YouTube channel, and the dude just hit a thousand subscribers. He has a video with forty thousand views. You want to know That's what he's sick. you want to know what he's talking about? He's what? he's talking about how he's an American football fan that is learning the game of rugby. And for some reason that has just exploded on YouTube and the dude is like skyrocketing. He's like growing at a pace that I've never even grown at with my channel. It's I'm amazing. It's awesome. I love it. I, lo I love the YouTube Twitch marketing stuff. I've gotten super into it recently with exploring more video making and, and streaming yeah. and stuff like that. And there are a lot of weird things that will randomly pop off. Yeah. Where, like, I never would have expected. Right. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's nuts. So uh, he, wants to, he wants to know, how did you get into playing your instrument? Um, and was it a process of trying out several or were you drawn to it right away? Um, I got put into percussion as like a... a uh, a random happening. I, I joined band my seventh grade year. So there was already a year of middle school where I wasn't in the band program. And then I came in my second year of middle school. And uh, I walked in on like the third day of the school year. And I was like, hey, I just got switched to this class. Like I wanted to take band. And the band director was like, uh, okay, <laughs> like, go stand back there next to the concert bass drum. It was like, go hang out back there. Like, I'll be over there here in a minute. And like, we'll talk about some stuff. Mm -hmm. So I randomly got placed in drums and I haven't done anything else as seriously as I've done drums. I was mm -hmm. able to maintain that, that level of velocity all the way to now. Mm -hmm. And I have explored other stuff. Like I love messing around with Ableton and I have like MIDI keyboards all over the place. And I mess with, uh, you know, vocal processing and things like that just because I'm as well a computer geek and mm -hmm. I love technology and it's why I love video making and editing and production. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it was cool that I could stick with drums for so long and it gave me a good foundation to be able to explore other stuff and feel right. good about doing other things. Yeah. And then so you, you kind of dipped your toes in the quad world for that, that one summer. And so I, I think that's important to highlight though, just, you know, starting with percussion then getting to high school and then having that interest in snare drum and then doing quads and 
it sort of it solidified your place in the marching percussion, but you knew that snare drum was where you wanted to be. Yeah, snare drum is where I went back to, but yeah, I did have like my very first season at Forsyth Central, my freshman year, I was on bass drum for both okay, yeah. the marching season and the Scholastic World Indoor season. Mm -hmm. And then I did snare drum my sophomore year for both seasons, and then I went to quads for CV and then back to snare drum. So yeah, I got the taste of, besides the cymbal line, yeah. having like every bit of like a, a world-class drum experience on every battery section in some respect, yeah. which was super cool. Yeah. Um, so he has another question. Uh, this one he actually wants the both of us to answer. Um, he asks, what advice would you give someone who is interested in drum corps or marching band? And uh, what are your thoughts on the age requirements for starting or ending for drum corps, too young slash old? So you can go ahead and start with what advice you'd want to give. Yeah, uh, I think advice... Um have an intention or a mission going into it. You know, I think it's hard to just like step into the world of drum corps without any real reason behind it or any purpose to it. Um, and it just become fruitful as you do it. It's a super hard thing and it's super grimy and you feel gross when you do it. And it's super hardcore and you're rehearsing 12 hours a day. And so like for me, the BK17 season was like a a release because I got to escape the real world and I got to literally dedicate my entire human being to just completing this one job. Mm -hmm. So I was always the dude like at the end of rehearsal, like I would yell, crank the chill <laughs> and I would like book it to the truck. My mm -hmm. drum would be the first one in the truck. I would book it to the showers. Like I was the first one showered. I was the first one out. I was immediately on my laptop writing drill for my fall marching band group. Wow. And I was like playing RuneScape while all of the other dudes were coming out of the showers. Like I was finished with my work yeah. and I was like playing video games while they were like finally finishing their general procedure for the day. Yeah. And it was one of those experiences where I, I literally got to be like superhuman mm -hmm. and I just got like my only job is to be good at drums and run real fast. And I got to do it for three months and I was probably the best at it. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was so cool. So I think that when it comes to like advice, you know, for me, the purpose was, you know, like whatever's going on in real life, that's not necessarily my priority or important right now. Like I'm dedicating myself to experiencing this to the fullest mm -hmm. and like I want to go hard at it. And that was enough for me to maintain my momentum all season and mm -hmm. feel really good about it. Yeah. My answer is very boring. Um, just from right off the rip, when you start picking up the sticks, just turn on a metronome and learn how to play in time very early. The first That'll thing help. you do should be learn how to play in time because that's something I I was terrible at that. I I picked up the sticks uh, like right around a few months into my freshman year. I I had played bass in like a garage little you know pop punk band in middle cool. school, and so when I got to high school, I noticed that there was a jazz bass player in the marching band i was like oh that's the instrument i play i'll do marching band um and then they i didn't play bass i actually played synth because they didn't have a bass part that year but then there that you. was i band camp i heard a snare drum and i was like oh my god i'm gonna do that and so i grabbed a pair of sticks and just started learning snare drum but i was learning like all of the wrong things i was trying to play like chino hills high school stuff pulse sure. stuff blue coat stuff and i was just like ramming and like yeah, you Skojo. can't speak the language. Yeah, and you're trying exactly. To, you're trying to play verse. Exactly. Literature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like Skojo was my idol, and I was like, look at the week. Like I gotta learn that. But I never turned on a metronome, and I never wanted to work on my taps. I never wanted to work on flam interp. Like I yeah, just all that grammar stuff. Grammar so, was not important. Yeah. It was about saying full sentences. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> so my my best advice would just be save all of that for later because you're gonna be so much better at it when you pay your dues and do all the basic stuff first For sure. um and that's the that's the last answer that any freshman playing snare drum would ever want to hear but i was boring yeah yeah <laughs> um and then so the age requirements um i believe the uh the youngest you can be is 14 and then the age out 21 um with the exception of wgi 22 right do you feel that um 14 might be too young to let someone do the activity should it should it be a little bit you know maybe 17 or 18 and do you think would, we should i would say 18 yeah and then do yeah. you think um i'll let you elaborate more on that one before i ask the age out question yeah yeah i think i think 
even my experience at Atlanta Quest when I was 16, when I was a junior in high school, just doing indoor, I was exposed to so many adult and college antics and things that I probably wasn't necessarily in a position to be experiencing mm-hmm. or able to handle in like a mature or like healthy way. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I'm always fearful of my super young kids that like really want to go out and get the experience super fast. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also don't want to like stop them from doing it sometimes because mm-hmm. there are some like really young members that can handle it mm-hmm. and they are going to come out of it better in the end for it. And so, yeah, maybe 17, 18. I do think 14 is far too young. Yeah. Even at 16, I was struggling to handle those things in a productive way. Yeah. In when I marched Mandarins in 2013, I was only 16. Josh was 15. And then there was a 14 year old playing trumpet. Oh and God. I thought that that was just, I mean, I wasn't much older, but, f- you know, as a 16-year-old already about halfway through high school, going into my senior year, I, I thought 14 was too young. And I couldn't imagine, you know, because that first year I did Mandarins, anybody that marched with me knows what I went through that year. But I, you know, was a pretty unhealthy kid. I went from getting cut from the snare line to being on the cymbal line, um, just before spring training started, but then before spring training, I quit the cymbal line because I just couldn't handle it. I, it was sure. I couldn't figure out the drill. I was missing step offs, and I just it was overwhelming for me as a 16 year old. So I ended up finishing out the season on rack, which was still a great experience. Yeah. I got to you know march sure. drum corps with my best friend, and and I you know I don't regret it one bit. But like 14 playing trumpet too, because I mean. With exception to some drum lines, brass, I feel, is one of the hardest sections to really be in, just based off of kind of the reputation that brass staff have of just laying into you every day, every hour. Yeah. And At 14, I was I was still writing notes to girls that I had crushes on because yeah. I couldn't just, like, say anything that I wanted to say in person. So right. So it's, like, it's one of those things where it's like, I can barely handle a normal situation in high school in a mature and functional manner. At 14, you expect me to go on tour for three months with all of these adults yeah. and like represent your organization to the fullest? Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah, so I, I think I'd agree with you. Maybe 16 at the absolute youngest, but I think ideal um, is 18. Like March your high school, then take care of that. Don't worry about what's going on in the summer. Be a kid during the summer. Yeah. And then, I think being extra extra considerate of all of the the potential abuse and safety things that have already been too rampant in mm-hmm. our activity, it's one of those things where it's like trying to push that age limit lower or trying yeah. to justify young people doing it maybe is not the way to go in this current time. Like yeah. older is better in this moment until we can figure out those base problems and provide a safe experience for as many marching members as we can. Yeah. And then let's talk about how we can involve the younger age group. Yeah. One thing... You mentioned with the whole like experience thing of, of some of your younger students. I always advocate for um, students to actually just go to the auditions. Like if they're like, oh, I'm thinking about auditioning, you know, for this group. I'd Yeah, go to the auditions because yeah. you're going to get different information. And that's just going to you know, only, you know, expand your knowledge and learn the language of the activity. Dude, yeah, um, it expands your vocabulary. Yeah, right? and so I think it would be important if, you know, maybe they somehow – in the future say, okay, we're not letting 14 year olds do this, but still give 14 year olds the opportunity to come to the auditions at least, yeah. which I don't think they I, would, they yeah. would turn anyone, anyone away. You see like Brandon Olander at all these system blue camps, they're not going to turn, turn away, you know, the young yeah. kids that are wanting to I mean, to from a business standpoint as well, drum right. corps are just trying to make as much money as possible as yeah. well as create the productive experience that they can. So it's like there is no disadvantage to a hosting an educational and audition camp during right. your audition season that can host 12-year-olds, right. you know, but they may not be going for a spot, but they're getting the educational experience. That yeah, it's, is, it's still yeah. extremely important. Yeah. Um, so then on the other side of the spectrum, do you think the age out – um, ages are too young, just right. Maybe we can cut them off early. Say you turn 20, you're done. Yeah. I, I don't know how I feel about this one necessarily. I've seen so many arguments for like dispelling the age out and I've seen so many arguments for like lowering the age out. I think there is a good balance that we have right now where 
as older experienced super vets are leaving the activity, mm -hmm. there is a, a wave of new people mm -hmm. coming into those ensembles. And it's not, from what I've seen, it hasn't put any groups in a position to where they can't maintain a culture. Mm -hmm. Like every group I've been to that has been existing for a while, like has a culture that they've established because they have four and five year members and those four and five year members leave mm -hmm. and they've impressed enough on the younger members to maintain that culture for a long period of time. I think extending the age out makes the whole activity more competitive, mm -hmm. but less accessible, which mm -hmm. I think is a problem. Yeah. Like we need to have those new members getting these experiences. Um, and lowering the age out is just like, closing the gap down too small and we squeeze out the opportunity to grow a culture of a group because every year a new member is coming in and there's no extended stay right so yeah i think i think it's good where it's at to be honest uh, i think the pandemic is obviously going to cause some rub you know with like who is an age out and who gets bonus years because of the situation right but i think the 21 22 area is more than fine i think we need younger people in the activity yeah i was going to bring that up with the initial reaction to extend um the 2021 season to the 2020 age outs i thought that was a pretty interesting um sort of thing they did because i was always joking about how i wish i could march till i was like 25 or something like i wish we i wish groups yeah. you know could to essentially get like stacked you know like i always yeah. dreamed about the the rcc group with like you know um just the you know the rcc greats that came out of the organization just continuing to march there and how good they could get but you also yeah. got to think about you just get burnt out and then you know you're an adult and so it's you got to move on to real life you know because you're spending all this money to do this kind of thing but Sure. That's and it. I think that the problem too is like there are some adults who manage to adjust themselves to real life and maintain all those responsibilities and still want to do the indoor thing. Yeah. Like that's why I'm teaching Quest. If I had the opportunity to be marching in the line still, I can't say that I would have said no. Yeah. Like I may be still in that environment if I had been given that choice as soon as I was aging out because I, I loved what I was doing there and I was still maintaining a full-time job and doing my normal projects. and. Mm -hmm you know, all of it felt pretty balanced at the time. So I think given the opportunity, there would be a surprising amount of older people who yeah. have kind of figured some of their life stuff out that are like, yeah, let's go for it. And you'd have some really stacked groups that's really going to make the barrier for entry uh, a problem. Yeah, I'd be I'd be lying if I, if I didn't say that I'd entertained the idea of doing a year of DCA, you know, after I aged out. Because I feel like I sort of um, missed out Eh, I mean, I did three years of drum corps and two years of WGI and had, you know, the great opportunity of sort of, you know, making history with both groups. I got to be in Dark Sky when they first made finals and I got to be in Mandarin's when they first made finals. Yeah. That's so that's sick. like a pretty damn good. And I did INE and did fairly successful in that. So I you feel sure like, did. yeah, I feel like, like, you know, my career on paper is pretty you cool. You did successful in the INE thing, not even in like the necessarily scoring respect, but yeah. the, the fact you had an... I was always kind of curious about it too. From your two INE solos, there was mm -hmm. a very clear message and a process you went through for it. I yeah. was impressed at how receptive people were to it. Yeah. And the fact that people like kind of went on to the videos that you posted about it being like, that's sick, dude. Like, yeah. good for you. That was for, like writing solos with that kind of intent. Like, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That was a, an extremely stressful, too long, uh, two year long experiment that I went through. I'm sure. with that. Yeah. I would have been nerve wracked to, yeah. to even attempt something like that. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. But, um, um, yeah, and then when I transferred, um, working on finishing school, I transferred up here to Sac State um, with the the marching band they've got you know here. I've actually known a ton of people um, who march mandarins go to Sac State and are in the marching band, and so that cool. it was on my radar that way. The band director is actually um, the uh, one of the trumpet techs from back in 2013 when I marched mandarin, so I already knew him in that respect. Um, and so I joined because I was like, you know what, I'll do. I'll do one last little marching year and of course the pandemic hit i couldn't get on the field but um that was always super exciting to just be like oh, i get to put on the drum for like one last time one more time and yeah. then i was doing something um that ended up not working out just for logistical reasons but i was doing um similar to what uh sergio and cameron ayers uh what they were doing with the marching vlogs there was a group um sort of in the bay area that i was doing um with that it didn't really pan out to be what we had hoped for um Sure. Just, yeah, plainly logistical reasons. We ended up uh, cutting it short. But um, this upcoming fall, I'm actually 
going to be on the teaching side of things for Sac State with the marching band and the drum line. And so I think that sort of kind of going through the crisis I was having with wanting to march more and not feeling I got enough out of the activity, but sure. then just sort of kind of coming down to him like, yeah, I'll teach Sac State. Like that's sort of kind of where I'm at. That's what I'm better at. I'm, I'm getting too old. I don't need to try to live in this. Yeah. And I think you'll be surprised by how fulfilling it actually is. Mm-hmm. Like, I think at this point, I've gotten super like sappy and emotional about drums Mm -hmm. where like I know how important of an experience it was to me, not just because it was cool and performative and intense, but it was like, it grew me a lot as a person. I became very thoughtful because of like the stuff that I learned and the concepts that I had to figure out. And so it was one of those things where like transitioning to teaching, like I cry when my kids play well. Yeah. Like when my kids like play real good stuff and I'm like, dude, I know what that felt like. I did that like four years ago. Yeah, like it's always so close to me still being a performer that when I watch my kids like do crazy shit, or I watch the AQ dudes like have a perfect rep of their snare break all of a sudden, yeah, or like I will get emotional and my face will turn red and I like tear up a little bit and yeah. be like, oh dude, like that's a cool experience. Like yeah. I'm glad you guys get that right now. Yeah, so yeah, the teaching thing is gonna feel good. Um, so the next question, if you could only have one, I already know the answer to this. Would you choose to march DCI or WGI? Yeah, WGI, of course. Yeah, we've already touched on that. Yeah. WGI is my love, man. Yeah, yeah I, I love what Drum Corps did for me. Drum Corps provided the world where like I could go 100%, like super hard, super Saiyan version of band. Mm-hmm. And WGI was the place where I got to deliver all of the language that I was learning back to the members and uh, yeah, and have like a super growthful and fulfilling experience. So yeah, I would do WGI again. I would stick with Quest and I would just fucking do it more. Yeah. Um, so last question, uh, a little bit deeper. How did you stay mentally strong throughout DCI and WGI? I'm pretty new to world class, never marched independent, and I'm having a tough time being mentally strong through WGI. Is there anything uh, you think about or do? I, I don't think I was mentally, I was, I was mentally strong. I, there's an adjective that, so at the end of the BK season, I got lucky enough to be named Battery Member of the Year in 2017. Mm-hmm. I got this sweet plaque, and mm-hmm. the staff pulled me up onto the stage during the whole like retreat thing. Uh, and they they use like the word tenacious. Like mm-hmm. I was very, I had tenacity mm-hmm. to where like no matter like what was going on in rehearsal, like whether the brass line was being bullshit or like someone was getting yelled at or like there was like a huge like downward trend and vibe, mm-hmm. like I was still in MCM soldier mode. I was still running to my resets. I was still like performing it with the same intensity that I had been trained to perform with in 2015. Um, And so I don't think that I was necessarily like mentally strong in my season, but there was a certain tenacity that I had to where I was like, I'm not gonna let this get to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm just gonna push through until it's the wave is passed and then I can evaluate on it a little bit Mm -hmm. and, and see like, was it something that I should have reacted to? Like, did I make a mistake? by putting my blinders on right. and like not focusing on it? Or like, was it actually something important that I can reflect on now and still make a productive and constructive decision on like how to fix? So I think for me, I still at the time considered myself like mentally weak mm-hmm. and I felt sad a lot of the time and I felt bad throughout the season. I felt gross in days and we were in like the worst states and we were super humid and sweaty. Like none of it was great in those respects but i had like a mission when i was there Mm -hmm. and i had the ability to kind of put my blinders up and say like i can weather the storm until it's far enough past that i can like ask myself should i have weathered that storm like did i make a mistake by not saying something or am i okay now and like can i totally make it through i think in the end like people end up more okay than they expect Mm -hmm. after some of the drum corps experiences, even though they're super hard. Yeah. But yeah. It was kind of like a horse with blinders on situation when yeah. I was there. So kind of going back onto something that you touched on, it's sort of, you know, remembering that you have that purpose and you have that focus, you know, like what are, what are the goals? What do you want out of this? And then sort of just kind of going through the bullshit as it comes up. Yeah. I I think I, <laughs> I was privileged to have some bad experiences in real life that I was trying to run away from at the time. Like, like I had uh, a real life re- sort of relationship thing that I like wasn't super clear on and super comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And I had like some struggles with my family at the time and I just kind of moved out and I didn't know like what I was doing necessarily. And so drum corps in the moment, I had the immediate purpose of like, 
I don't need to focus on any of that for three yeah. months. Like I'm just here to go hard and no yeah. one's going to take that away from me. Like doesn't matter what happens on the field. Like I'm going hard and it feels good. Yeah. And so, yeah, it probably wasn't like, there's probably a more constructive and a more thoughtful way to like approach drum core and like recognize how you're feeling in those moments and like figure out the right, right way to react to them that is productive and still makes you feel like you're you know fulfilled in some way but at the time i was just like soldier mode bro like let's go yeah um one thing that it helped me personally was music so like when kind of the rough drum corps days you know I'd get on the bus or I'd, I'd go lay down in the gym and I'd so just funny. close yeah. my eyes and put in headphones. And like, that's such, that's, that's like 90% of the people, like music is the escape. You just put on, you know, your pop, you know, guilty pleasures. Like for me, it was Lady Gaga. Yeah. She just, she helped me through some of the worst times in drum corps. But it's as much as a, uh, as a phoned in answer as that is, but just being able to find that escape. And for me, it was music. I think both of my seasons, I had very intimate experiences with music as yeah. like, partially an escape a third escape mechanism like i was using drum corps to escape from the real life and yeah. then i need to escape from drum corps yeah. i'd escape to the music and so like when i was marching spirit 2014 i had the regina specter blue world album like every single day like i would go to sleep i'd be staring at the ceiling like hoping for this to end because i didn't like that season and i would just be like listening to it yeah. and then 2017 like i was surprisingly not social for like how hard I was going at BK like when I was on the bus like my headphones were in and I was focused on what I was doing whether it was writing drill or like playing RuneScape mm -hmm. and uh and even at retreat in 2017 uh, I had uh my headphones and I like strung them up through my uniform and like had my earbuds in the whole time I didn't talk to oh, anybody wow. during retreat on the field like I was like like I'm about to walk onto my age out retreat yeah. and I'm about to have an experience with this album playing in the background and like I know you guys are here with me but like this is for me, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of it's one of those weird experiences where, yeah, I was like, I was in my own place, even though I was like working for the ensemble. Yeah. Well, very cool. So that's it for the questions. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on, we're almost done, um, is kind of what have you been up to these days outside of the activity? I know you're uh, doing some Twitch stuff, you got some YouTube stuff. So I wanted to give you the opportunity just to kind of, you know, say what's going on and what you would want people to come to to check you out. Yeah, sweet plug. Yeah, I, I like talking to people. I, I think it's fun. I, I like broadcasting. I play a lot of video games. I've always played video games. My original intention was to go to school for computer science and programming. So it's like I have classic games, old school RuneScape, World of Warcraft. I've played since I was like five or six years old. Still haven't stopped playing them. Uh, you know, I have shooters, CSGO, and Call of Duty that I'm always into. And so I just stream a bunch of random stuff. Um, I stream stuff both about the band world and drums and about just video games and the stuff that I enjoy doing in my free time, whether mm -hmm. it's learning new music or learning new stuff. Um, I just like broadcasting. And so I do put that stuff up on my YouTube channel. I have my Twitch at ZK Watson with a zero instead of an O. Mm -hmm. And I have my YouTube at Zach Watson. And that's where all my stuff goes. Sweet. Yeah, I will put all of his links down in the description. Go check him out on Twitch and YouTube. Um, I'll put your Instagram down there as well. Yeah, um, but I... man, I appreciate you coming on here, being the first guest for Monday Morning Moccasins. It was a blast. It's really Happy to cool be to, honored. Really, really it was really great it. to talk to you again after you know kind of all these years. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. Sweet man. Well, best of luck with all of your future endeavors, and we'll be in touch. I'm, I'll probably talk to you all the time now. Yeah, no doubt. Talk to you later, man. Cool, man. Peace. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Zach is extremely knowledgeable, super down to earth, and just a really great guy. And so I'm extremely honored that he agreed to be our first guest here on Monday Morning Moccasins. Please go follow him on all of those platforms. Go give him some love and some support. Um, he's on Twitch, YouTube, and his Instagram. All three of those will be below. Um, I created a brand new Twitch account just so I can go follow him. Um, so you have no excuses. So go follow him. Um... But that's it for this episode of Monday Morning Moccasins. I'll see you on the next one. Again, huge thanks to Zach. Um, cue the outro music.